Hi, welcome to More Christ. Today I'm joined by Dr. Andrew Root and once again by Pastor Paul Vanderley. Andrew is Kerry Olson Balson Professor of Youth and Family Ministry at uh, Luther Seminary in St. Paul, in Minnesota in the USA. He's the author of several books, including Faith Formation in the Secular Age, The Pastor in the Secular Age, Congregation in the Secular Age, and most recently, Churches in the Crisis of Decline, which I really want to focus in on today. So, and Paul Vanderclay then is a pastor and minister in the Christian Reformed Church of North America. He's pastor of Living Stones in Sacramento, California. He's also something of a YouTube sensation. He offers a co compelling commentaries and complex and social trends and figures. He's even something of a pastor to many of us in what may be called this little corner of the internet. And uh, so today then I want to look at some of the key trades in your recent book, Andrew, and sort of tease those out with, uh, in line with Paul's experience as a pastor in the local church and even online, I suppose. So if we look at that book then, um, what moved you to write it, Andrew? And what do you hope that readers will take away from it then? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. And it's great to talk to Paul again. So um, yeah, it's it's great. So uh, I think like the biggest push of the book was to, I've had this problem, which is uh, read Charles Taylor's work uh, years ago and have tried to, I wouldn't say synthesize it, but kind of tease out its implications and it's taken me four books to be able to do that um, to look at its ramifications so <laughs> at some point I'll hit the bottom of that and it won't be won't be willing to go any further maybe um, but what what seemed kind of interesting to take another step forward in the in this ministry in a secular age series and write this more I guess kind of direct ecclesiology was just uh, thinking about the imminent frame more directly Taylor calls the kind of this imminent frame. And thinking, trying to put that in conversation with with Karl Barth and kind of uh, a certain recovery of Karl Barth as a pastor, as opposed to this kind of dogmatic theologian and wondering, I mean, there's a, there's almost kind of a little like sci-fi move here of, of kind of imagining this early 21st century project of Charles Taylor and trying to bring it back in time and drop it in the lap of this you know, early 20, 20th century theologian, Karl Barth, and, and kind of making a, an assertion that I think Barth's early work is really trying to come to grips with uh, the imminent frame and is trying to kind of build a theological vision that can address the imminent frame, though he doesn't have any of that language yet. yet. He doesn't have the kind of Taylor social critique. So that was the, what kind of drew it out. But, you know, more practically, it's just, I think, overall, what's so helpful or haunting about Taylor's work is it, it does point out that some of our deepest passions to try to help the church and try to uh, save ministry, at least in North America, may make it worse. And I think this is one of those, those realities that we feel decline is this big issue and we keep racing towards it and kind of lighting our hair on fire thinking, you know, everyone's leaving, leaving the church. And if we're not really careful, our responses to that, and even our interpretations of what's in decline or what is a crisis uh, becomes mis misguided. So the title has a, a very kind of clickbait title to it, like the crisis of, of decline, which, <laughs> you know, a you, title. <laughs> it's a very good title. I'm very thankful for that title, which is what, as you can see, it wasn't mine. It's the publisher's title. Uh, but I do, I, you know, like when the book was announced, had all sorts of people emailing me like, oh yeah, I think, I think the issues decline too. And boy, we got to do something or the church is going to disappear from the face of the earth. And it was like, ah, uh, that's actually part of my point is to say that we focus too much on decline and we lose the bigger crisis which the imminent frame gives us the crisis of helping people really encounter a, a living god and that inside an imminent frame the crisis is this god still speaks this god still lives and yet we inherit a context where that seems more and more implausible to people almost as a reflex so that's a mouthful but i think that's kind of what and in, what inspired it maybe yeah Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. And then just, uh, Paul, if I might ask you, what were some of your key impressions of this work or even of uh, Andrew's wider project that he's heading out there? Well, I, I know that Andrew's um, work is, is, is being read by pastors in my space. The, the church is sort of bifurcated right now. It's always bifurcated, but it's more than two. Um, and, and so there are there are pastors that are sort of I don't like using right and left because it doesn't really get at it, but that's sort of where we're at culturally now. Pastors who are leaning right tend to, you know, they're not they're probably not even going to have read any Karl Barth. 
Um, and, you know, I like early in the book, you know, Karl Barth sort of says, you know, coming out of kind of the uh, coming out of peak modernism in the church. And, and you can see that in Barth's upbringing, this struggle between um, sort of the, the line in the church of, of parts of the church that um, rather undramatically just say God, because that's what we've always said and always done. And they're maintaining what we've always said and always done. And then other groups that tend to be usually at the the higher ends, the, the higher ends of the culture um, that tend to have the status and the money and control for whom saying God isn't something that you speak in public. And of course, Taylor nicely, I mean, Taylor's work really sort of brought that up into consciousness in a whole new way. And so it's interesting because I think, you know, 15 years ago, only wonky people read Charles Taylor. Five years ago, anybody who's going to have any status in public mainline conversations or even neo-evangelical even neo -evangelical conversations will have to have read Taylor or had some familiarity with him, um, have, to, have to engage in this question of secularity. And, and so in I really like the book in that I think you're right that in some ways Taylor is sort of like Bart for our time. And so then comparing the two is, is really helpful. Mm -hmm. And I, I had at Calvin seminary. So in Western Michigan, you have Calvin seminary and Western seminary. Mm -hmm. If you went to Calvin seminary, you never studied Bart because he's neo-Orthodox. We're Orthodox. Mm -hmm. If you went to Western Seminary, you studied Bart. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so there are these lines in our culture where the high status, well-educated um, churches that are still on Main Street will be conversant in Bart and Taylor, whereas churches that are, they're not on Main Street, they're way out in the suburbs. The world of Bart and Taylor is impacting them, but they've, in a sense, not had to go there because they never stopped saying God. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Paul. And um, if I might ask you then, so as Paul is sort of hinting out there, you want to go beyond the modern social constructs of, say, left and right. But also, I think what came across whenever I read the book was how Barth goes beyond the kind of fundamentalist or merely kind of liberal or whatever you want to call it paradigm. Would you like to speak to that? And um, the case that he actually makes, Andrew, for the true and living God and how he operates within the imminent frame, as you sort of suggest. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, I think Paul's what Paul just said is really a helpful, a helpful statement, and, and especially about that kind of returning to saying the great word God again, and how I think it still exists within our cultural realm, where at least in North America, there is this group that so easily talks about God, um, almost to the point where God is a brand, like it, it's it's a, a slogan, and and we brand everything with with God, some kind of God language, and I think Bart grew up um, in somewhat in that kind of context a little bit. I think he was aware of, of certain forms. Of, I mean, it's different, this kind of German pietism that he was very aware of, um, that maybe his father leaned a little bit towards, that he, he, he's not comfortable with. And, that, and I think for people who become, and I think this is still true, people who become uncomfortable with God as a brand really seem like the kind of liberal university-based kind of theology seems so appealing and it becomes a kind of move into maturity. It becomes a, a, a move beyond um, all the kind of immature kind of faith that you now imagine probably unhelpfully and in, in its own immature way that you kind of reject. 
But what's really fascinating about Bart's story is that he accepts that he finally fights with his father and goes and is able to get himself to Berlin and study in that faculty and then get himself to Marburg and study in that faculty and, you know, starts editing a journal and, and he's, he's done it. He's, he's kind of risen to the elite status of academic theology and then decides to go and become a preacher. And in some ways, I think there, I, I try to draw this line and maybe some of the, the Bart bros out there, or the real protective Bartian scholars will be angry with me, which I'm sure a lot of them will be angry with me, actually. But I do think there's a, a kind of father complex with Bart here where he, he actually goes back to the pastorate because he's interested in reconnecting with his father. And there's been a lot of conflict of, of him being the oldest child, kind of punching, metaphorically punching his father in the stomach to make room for him to kind of find his own theological voice and differentiate himself from his father. But then there's kind of this move back and then there just becomes this profound reality where his father dies and then he has to preach every week. Like Paul was saying before the recording started, you have to get a draft of the sermon done here on Thursday. And he's he's in the suburbs, essentially. I mean, he's actually in a rural context more than even in the suburbs, but he's in a place where he's far away from the university. He's far away from kind of the elite centers of of society. He's back in Switzerland. He's not in Germany anymore. And he starts to realize he has really nothing to, to preach. Um, and then, of course, the world catches a blaze with World War I, and he has to find a way to say the word God again. And I, I do think there's a kind of, it's too easy to say Bart finds a middle ground, but Bart wants to find a way to speak of God where God isn't just a brand and doesn't become kind of captured and inactive in a kind of religious ethos where we just kind of perpetuate this kind of religious subculture. But at the same time, he thinks that this movement away from closing the world off, like Taylor talks about kind of this closed world structure of the world where, where God and transcendence can't get into it, he doesn't believe that's a way forward and there's no way to do ministry in that way. So he has to try to find a a way between those. And one of the things that I try to raise in the book that I think is really interesting and a lot of North American BART scholars will not even touch because it makes BART seem a, a too much like out in those suburbs, as, as Paul was saying, is that he's really inspired by the two Blumharts, these pietist Germans who have these very kind of, well, the, the older Blumhart has this very exorcism kind of experience, but both of these Blumharts do this ministry out of this, their, their own pastoral ministry deeply out of the sense that God still acts, that the God of the Bible still can act in this world. And I think for Bart, as he admires these two, that becomes for him the kind of case study that what happened with the older Bloomheart, this kind of exorcism that happens in the middle of the 19th century, and then how they they form this uh, kind of healing ministry, which basically becomes like a retreat center in Bad Bull, where people come for prayer and deliverance, um, things that now a lot of like intellectual Christians who, who read Bart would be very uncomfortable with. For Bart, that becomes a kind of case in point that this this strange God of the Bible, this strange world of the Bible can still make its way into modernity. And Bart doesn't want to be anti-modern. So he's not taking a kind of classic fundamentalist step back and saying like, let's just, let's get, let's go, let's go back behind modernity or let's, let's, let's destroy modernity. He doesn't think that's possible either. So he wants to be a modern pastor. He wants to be a modern person, but he does want to make a wager that even in a modern world, God can act. And these bloom hearts who pray and people are healed and where a demon is cast out of a young woman and it, and it, it screams, uh, Jesus is victor. Like those become for him uh, still a possibility that God can act. And yet I think we, we, don't, we don't draw on those enough when we even talk about Bart's story, let alone the kind of church's story. Um, and, and so I'm trying to kind of raise, raise that as, as well. Thank you, Andy. And uh, something that I think comes across in the book and also in your work and what you seem to have suggested, Paul, and um, is the importance of physical place and that kind of rooted, embodied nature of the church uh, in, in contrast to an kind of abstract notion. Uh, would you like to speak to that and why that's important and why maybe this our online ministries can only serve as a a supplement to a healthy embodied church and would you put that to you paul well you know when when i 
you know, like I said, I didn't, we, Calvin Theological Seminary in the 1980s gave us uh, almost zero time with BART, even though BART's work, of course, launches, you know, you've got BART, you've got Bonhoeffer, you know, you have these 20th century neo-Orthodox um, lights who will then inspire, let's say, the Niebuhr's, um, they'll have this whole American neo-orthodoxy movement, which will be a significant part of the mid 20th century, um, the mid 20th century modernist neo-orthodox revival that in many ways sort of, sort of captures and is a significant part of what becomes the most, uh, the period in, in the United States when church per capita church attendance reaches its peak. And Andrew writes about that really well in one of his previous books that I read. And, and it's interesting to me when I look at Bart Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer, of course, has this um, critical experience of traveling to North America, um, seeing the Black experience in the North in North America, and you know, translating some of that. And I think fo that follows some of this. Now, a generation before that, in the Netherlands, you had Abram Kuyper, who in, in many ways is sort of pre-neo-Orthodox. He, he doesn't really, you know, Calvin Seminary would never call Abram Kuyper neo-Orthodox, and neither would someone like Doug Wilson, um, who it's funny whenever I hear Doug Wilson talk about Abram Kuyper. And in my communities, Abram Kuyper is, is sort of in different places. But you had the same experience with Abram Kuyper, who he... He sort of rises, rises on the theological liberalism of his day and then has to go to a country parish and preach there and with, you know, feelings probably full of himself, as many young seminarians do, that he's got all of this theological education from the people with all the high status and the theological elite world and then trying to preach to regular people and they just basically are like, you're not saying anything. You're not saying anything that's helping me live my life. And until you figure out how to say something, you're not gonna have any status in this community. And, and, and so this, this question about locale is, is critical in all of these individuals for, for Bart, to have to become a preacher to regular people and realizing that all of this heady liberal theology, it's worthless. You know, I learned some of that too at you leave seminary and you're working on sermons and okay, you know, everyone's talking about Boltman. How helpful is Boltman in writing a sermon? It's like zero. A lot of these modernist commentaries were completely unhelpful because they're debating source criticism and, you know, all of this stuff. And it's like, I'm talking to regular people who are dealing with death, betrayal, um, abortions, adulteries, joblessness, and, and they want to know whether or not Jesus has their back. That's what they need to know. And, and, and this is, of course, where Taylor comes in, because Taylor helps say, these are all the reasons why basically in, in our contemporary frame, there's no space for God. And, and even though a lot of that really gets going and really settles in in the middle of the 19th century and Darwin sort of pushes a lot of it over the edge. And so you have all of this accommodation to try to not lose all the sunk costs of, of Christendom by you know, Schleiermacher, well, it's a, it's a feeling and, you know, and Ritchell and Harnack, you're, you're doing all of this stuff not to lose Christianity in the modern frame. You know, Taylor comes along and says, you're in a closed system and there's, there's no room for this. I, I started working on the book of Romans for my Sunday school class and a guy who, you know, Job in the Netherlands, who, you know, became a Christian through this old Jordan Peterson thing, writes to me and says, have you ever read Bart's commentary on Romans? No. So I picked up a used copy and I start to open it. It's like, wow. <laughs> so for, you know, for Bart, God just kind of comes in and smashes. And, and he, through this commentary and through others of his work, sort of says to the this 
this elite, these elite institutions, unlike the fundamentalists that just basically say, you know, stop wrecking our colleges, we'll found our own and go on without you. Bart continues to engage in the conversation. And so the locality in, in this respect is critical because while, and this is true in the Netherlands, even all the way back to the Council of Dort, while the elites hold the cities, you know, it's the, it's, it's the God people, the, the pagans, as it were, hold the country and to a certain degree in North America, the suburbs. Mm. And I would say this is the same in Ireland, actually, truth be told. Um, thank you for that, Paul. And uh, so another element of the work, which is most insightful, is you look, Andrew, at these um, so sociological trends, and you mentioned figures like Herman Rosso, who we can talk about afterwards. But one seminal event, uh, which I wanted to discuss, which you seem to mention a few times in the book, is uh, with the Second World War. I want to ask, what was the kind of long-lasting impact of uh, World War II on the church? And why was it then so seminal? And what does it actually reveal about modernity then? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a, a really good question. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting to kind of link together Bonhoeffer and, and Bart together. And I, I do think Bonhoeffer is more of the, the theologian who responds. I mean, Bart, of course, responds to World War II as well and writes the, um, you know, writes the Barman Confession and, and it is part of all that. But for Bart, really what reveals that something in modernity modernity is wrong is world is world war one um that he just he and th that's something so deeply wrong that he can look and see that his own teachers that he fought with his father to go study with that he that he demand i mean you can only imagine the kind of arguments um i don't know i actually don't know how early 20th century Swiss people fought. So maybe it was very passive aggressive and there was no fist pounding on a dinner table or anything like that. But the tension was was pretty deep. And so Bart fights to go study with these people. And then just, you know, a few, what, less than 10 years later, it looks on the on the newspaper and there's all his teachers that he admires who have signed off on the Kaiser's decree for war. And what I think Bart ultimately thinks has happened here um, and and really for him in some ways becomes um, what leads to him saying that he, you know, he doesn't really intend this, but that Romans commentary that Paul referenced becomes a bomb on the, on the playground of, of the theological establishment is that, uh, is that he sees that what, what's, that there's been this incredible flip where, where God is no longer God, but God has become part of the kind of accoutrement of the cultural religion of Germany. So in some sense, God has to serve the German nationalist desires, that God really is there to support um, our own way of, of trying to instill our culture, our own way of trying to kind of in, instill our, our will within the world. And Bart just thinks that's fundamentally problematic, that it reveals that when we when we speak of God, um, we really are just speaking of ourselves in a loud voice. And that's no way to speak of, of the God of the Bible. So, you know, Bart then tries in this, in this epistle to Romans, he thinks that the, the response to this is to return to God is God, that God is God, which has this kind of, you know, apoph apophatic kind of theological sense to it, where it, it, whatever God is, God's beyond all, everything we can know. And Everhart Bush, who's uh, Bart's last secretary and is 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 uh, main kind of uh i guess held biographer says that has an essay where he says you know this statement god is god is a slightly nonsensical statement like what does it actually mean it doesn't really mean anything god is god i mean it sounds good but what actually is he saying here and it's just two i mean it's three words two of those words repeat what is actually going on but i think what's what's still worth recovering and how we think about our own churches and how we think about our own ministries if we can claim god as god is the is and i think that's what bart wants to get to that does god still act is there is god doing something and i think what happens within modernity is the closed world structures that taylor wants to get us to have closed god off so much so that it's not as if god becomes completely pushed out where we don't even use the word God anymore. Instead, we, we use God as our pet. And that even becomes more diabolical, Bart thinks, that God becomes turned into our own kind of cultural pet. And I think Bart would say that happens both on the right and on the left, in, in, in some ways operated in different ways, but God becomes um, 
our pet, either like Paul was saying, it becomes like our, our model of our ethical best selves or becomes our justification for um, our, our, our kind of religious subculture or whatever. But ultimately, God isn't God. God is, um, God is, uh, God is our pet. And, and I think that becomes a real issue where so Bart wants to return to and create a space where and that invites the pastor to remind uh, his and her congregation that God is still God, that God still can move. Um, and I think that becomes pretty significant for him. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. And then, um, Paul, something that came across in the book was the compelling nature of socialism in Barth's time. And um, I want to ask you a little bit about that. And do you see any parallels now today with that? Well, I, I think again, going back to back to Taylor and and what Andrew just said, both the fundamentalists and the let's call them the liberal elites. And what I mean by liberal there is is not simply progressive, but sort of this classic liberal position of a closed system, is that in the fundamentalists that God is sort of encapsulated by usually by the the confessional orthodoxy of that closed system. And, and that's usually, you know, in, in use of Hybert's um, bounded state versus center state, it's, it's encapsulated within the confessional staves of that bounded system. And so that's how that God is, is that's how that God is basically civilized and contained. And whereas in, in the in the modern liberal sense, the God is immanentized and contained within the sort of the scientific frame. And, and socialism is in that way, and I think we've, we've seen some of this. So socialism is in that way, immanentizing God in the processes of psychology and sociology. Now, now we'll see that in fuzzy language about systems, because these these systems are all are all they're materialistly foundation they they sort of um, emerge up from materialism and they emerge up from humans and of course they have their basis in materialist evolution and those are the systems and and I think we're seeing this to a degree in let's say the Iranian crisis the Ukrainian crisis where in the first world war if you read the history of the first world war. It, it's, it is, in, in many ways, another religious war. Philip Jenkins wrote an excellent book on the, the theological elements of the First World War, where you know, England and France go to war against Germany, and everybody sees this, in a sense, as these are the conflicts of the of their, of their religions. And so if, if you are sort of captured in a in a socialized system, let's say, then, well, how is evil defeated? Well, it's clearly defeated through our institutions, through our means, therefore war is necessary. Now, Europe sort of got into a place where, of course, Germany has been disarming and it didn't you know, bother with defense spending because the thought of having another land war in Europe was preposterous because aren't we all beyond that? And yeah, maybe Putin is a little um, a little eccentric with his orthodoxy with, you know, with Alexander Dugan, but push comes to shove, he'll be real about it. He's getting money from Germany. And would he, would he take his religion seriously enough to threaten the kind of disconnection, financial disconnection from the West when he and his oligarchs really enjoy all of the luxuries that um, German money and European money has brought them? And the answer was uh, yes. <laughs> and so then suddenly, well, I, I thought we were beyond all this. Well, apparently we're not. So, and then the reaction to that and th this is amazing to me, you can find this in America's response to the First World War, you can find this in America's response to the, and the Spanish-American War, where the, the entire matrix in the United States can sort of light up and say, oh, well, we've got to, 
mobilize our armies and kill the infidel. Now, we don't use that language because that would make us sound like Islamists. But, you know, now Facebook has approved hate speech for Putin and his oligarchs, that you can now go on Facebook and threaten, um, threaten Putin with death and not have Facebook take down your posting. So, you know, we tend to look at the First World War and the mobilization of Germany behind the Kaiser as an anachronism. But then when the Ukraine comes up, suddenly you've got people on the left who, you know, were deeply uncomfortable about the invasion of Iraq. Um, you saw some of these dynamics recently in the historical rememberings of the Falklands War, you know, that it felt like an anachronism going and getting back those islands from the Argentines. But once, once it's, it sort of aligns that it's simply up to us to save the world, well, at some point, killing your enemies is going to be necessary. And we're a little shocked by that, but not nearly as shocked as we should be that, you know, we saw a little bit of it with the skedaddling from Afghanistan. How dare we leave all of those Afghani girls, you know, to be no longer educated by the Taliban. Now with Ukraine, it's much more real. So suddenly the left will say, yeah, we need an army because this is in fact, you know, sing the battle hymn of the Republic. It's, it's the same system. Thank you, Paul. Would you like to speak to that, Andy? Or? Yeah, I mean, I would just add that it, it is an interesting dynamic of, of Bart's biography where, um, you know, that he, in those pastor, in those pastor days particularly, it, he, he actually moves out of the kind of university, the, the kind of liberal theology as we've talked about it, as he gets into this kind of Christian socialism with it, Switzerland. And it's a very different kind of dynamic than I think we would think about in the late 20th century and in, into the 21st century, where those socialist movements were, particularly the Swiss one, was very kind of evangelical. And, and, and Herman Cutter and others were really thinking of it in biblical frameworks and thought like this was a, a faithful way of being. And what's fascinating is that uh, Christoph Blumhardt, who you know becomes so important to Bart, uh, thought the same thing and got very involved in the Socialist Party. And Bart meets him right as his disappointment has occurred, that he found his way all the way up into elected office and really thought that these kind of socialist movements would bring forth the kingdom of God, or at least would be a witness towards the kingdom of God. And then he realized the same thing that I think a lot of pastors realize about their denominations, which is that actually the party doesn't really care about the neighbor. It cares about perpetuating its own power, or the denomination doesn't really care about the gospel as much as it cares about keeping the denomination strong. And so the, the the younger Bloomhart kind of got into the socialist movement because he was really disgruntled with the church, that the church overall kind of spoke of how it cared for people and how it needed to, to reach out to those in poverty and in need, and then it didn't do anything. It, it was more concerned for its own existence. And then he went to the socialist party and thought, well, they'll, they'll do that, and then realized it was the kind of same dynamic. So Bart meets him right at that point where the younger is kind of uh, disgruntled with, with the socialist party and realizing that's not the answer either. Um, but nevertheless, God can still move. But I would say that we always have to remember Bart as the kind of red pastor. And a part of that was his pushback against the elites. I mean, there's a great story right in the midst of World War I or towards the end where Bart gets his salary cut in half because he marches for workers' rights. And there's some big donors in his church who do not like that. And then they vote to, to dock his pay. And I think a big reason that he was very invested in this in the socialist movement um, in Switzerland is because it taught him how to say the great word God again, but also that he um, he really thought it was a way to care for the people on the ground and over and against the factory owners and, and others uh, that exploited people. And yet I think he found in the end that um, that that was disappointing too. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a big piece of, the, of, of his story. Thanks, Andy. And um, in your book, you use a, a wonderful, very relatable story of St. John the Baptist Church 
and you speak about something I find very compelling, this uh, notion of dying before you're dying. Can you speak to that and why that's important? Yeah, I, I, you know, um, thanks for saying that that it's a compelling story because it could just be weird. Um, it, it, there's a little kind of Quentin Tarantino kind of move here where I, I try to do an alternate history. So I was sitting in a in a restaurant somewhere and uh, I was taken to this restaurant as, as I was at a, you know at a at a conference or something. You're like, you got to come to this restaurant. It used to be a church. It's now the best microbrew in the city. And the back of the, the menu had like a one paragraph on how this used to be a church. And then some corporation bought it and turned it into an establishment now that's won three years running the best chicken wings in you know the, the tri-state region or something. So I'm trying to play with the idea of what would have kept this church open because most denominations are really kind of existentially frightened of all their churches being turned into lofts or um, restaurants or, or something. And there, there tends to be this, this great fear that we better do something. We better really get innovative. We better really find a way to, to beat back decline or we're going to end. And so I try to tell this story in a way that what would have really kept this community open. And, and that's where I kind of couple it with, with, with Bart and, and try to say that what really would have brought life to this community is the encounter with a living God, not just the accruing of more resources to keep it open. And that it actually is quite a diabolical reality that the more we try to race and speed up or innovate to get more resources to keep us open, the more we close down the imminent frame, the more we make this closed world structure a possibility, the more we turn the church into a marketing strategy, into a, a, a small business, the more we... Um, the more the word God either becomes a brand or isn't uttered at all. And uh, so try to draw what, how this community might've lived in a way that would have infused it with, with life. If they would have maybe got the crisis correct, that the crisis wasn't that they were losing resources. The crisis was how to help their people encounter the living God again and, and in fear and in doubt. And in particularly in their experiences of loss, that there is ways that, the imminent frame cannot handle the the kind of existential dynamics of the human spirit. I don't think um, it can't really deal with it. So it has to pacify those in, in in multiple ways. So if a community could really dwell in and really walk with one another in the midst of that experience, does it open us up? So does kind of embracing these death experiences actually open us up to an encounter a God who lives and moves and ministers to the world again? So I was trying to play with that idea kind of more in a, in a narrative base. And one of the things that the younger Bloomhart taught Bart was that the faithful response of the Christian and the faithful response of the church, particularly inside modernity, inside of a yearning for a God who is God who still acts in the world, is then to be a community that waits for God. And that waiting becomes the kind of dynamic action of the church. And at least in, in the American consciousness, like, most pastors are told that's the last thing you should do. Don't wait around. You better do something. And at, at least if your church closes, you did something. And I just think it's a really huge paradigm shift of what would it mean to do and be churches and do ministry in a way that waits, that waits with one another, that waits for God, that hears each other's story, that prays and waits. And, um, and that's where I connect, as you mentioned earlier, this, this uh, thought of Hartmont Rosa and this kind of sense that there are ways that we that we function in the world that gives us, give us resonance. And so waiting isn't just a kind of, I mean, this is part of the problem with modernity. Modernity says, don't wait for anything. And waiting is boredom and waiting is waiting to die. But there are other ways that waiting actually infuses us with life. And, and it, it allows our relationships not to be instrumentalized, but just to be about connection and about what Rosa says is resonance. And so could we have churches could we as uh, could pastors lead churches that are communities that wait wait for god to come uh, and really tend to the resonant experiences of the community and the way we um share in each other's kind of death experience and narrate those and and wait for god in the midst of in the midst of that mm -hmm. would you like to speak to that paul and how you have seen that play out in community I, I, I really agree with, with it, what Andrew said there in terms of the, the irony of 
let's say, modernist fundamentalists, because fundamentalists don't often recognize that they're usually just as modernist as the, the other side that they were reacting against, in that there is a, there is a disbelief in, there, there is a disbelief in having to sort of take the reins and make it happen. And that usually comes via the doubling down on the the bounded set staves. Um, it usually it's a, it's a fear and control and an insistence that itself begins to warp, and then that's why you find all these refugees of controlling tyrannical um, orthodoxies escaping because you know it wasn't alive. It was a it was an embalming of a past thing. And so this, and I think that's probably my favorite, my, the favorite thing that I take away from Bart is, is the radicality of this intervention. And if it's, it's very Calvinist, <laughs> um, it's the radicality of this intervention and it is, it is God's move to make. And so I, I really like what Andrew says here in that the faithful wait on the Lord. Now, now that can, of course, also become an escapism in and of itself to inaction and unfaithfulness in various ways. But this, you know, I look, I guess there's two things. Number one is recognizing the, clock, the difference between the clock speed of God and the clock speed of a human lifetime. And it's very clear in scripture that God works multi-generationally. I mean, we're, we're focused on our little 80 to 100 years, and that's the, the, our focus, and that's, we're short-lived creatures, it should be, but God is playing a far longer game. And so to wait might mean you wait your whole life. Abraham, Abram waits you know, 75, God shows up. Where have you been the last 75 years? Says, oh, you're going to have a son. Great. Finally, my prayers have been answered. You're going to wait another 25. <laughs> you know, Jacob has this sort of great thing in the middle of his life. But after he gets back and has the encounter with Esau, you know, things don't go that well with Jacob and the brothers fight. And I mean, and so you, you very much get this sense that, um, God takes his time. And I think even in a lot of ways, some of the pacing of the book of Acts throws Christians off today that if you just sort of map out the book of Acts, you begin to realize, oh, um, there's a little bit of time between Pentecost and Stephen. And there's, you know, Paul, there's time between the road to Damascus and Paul's mission to Antioch with Barnabas. Paul has been out there 14 to 17 years doing, we're not quite sure what, before God is ready to send him to Antioch. And so I think what, what Andrew said there is exactly right, but it's, it's terrifying for us who live within this imminent frame mm -hmm. to wait because, and I think this is where Bart is so refreshing, because we have no faith. And so we, you know, to borrow a Jordan Peterson, um, we do what's expedient instead of what it's meaningful, but it's really hard for us to wait. Yeah. And um, Andrew, you you mentioned by using the, the work of Frost, uh, how I think part of the problem seems to be that there's this culture of busyness Oh, and you talk about that. Would you, would you describe that and why that's vital for us to wrestle with and how that um, busiest might actually be alleviated then? Yeah, I mean, and to build on what Paul said, I mean, it, it is really interesting that almost all kind of uh, church, um, like church networking things for pastors and things, and we talk about the kind of missional moves of the church, it almost always starts with Acts 2. You know, like, you know, we think about Acts 2 as the place where the missional impulse of the church starts. But I just wonder if we miss Acts 1, because in Acts 1, Jesus actually tells the disciples to go and wait. And I, I do think that the, the, that the church really starts in Acts 1 in 
in this kind of sense of waiting. And I think we like to start with Acts 2 because it seems like that's where the action is and that's where the busyness begins. And one of the things that I think building off Rosa and Taylor that is really true is Taylor wants to say every human being has a sense of fullness, that, that, you, that there's some kind of direction towards what it means to live well. That could be completely misguided and completely screwed up, but no one for the most part chooses to kind of aim towards bad things. They may, they may end up be aiming towards bad things, but they think that they're good, that they have some kind of sense that this is what will give their life fullness. Um, even if it's in a more immediate way, you know, um, than in, in, than an actual way. But I think what's what's interesting about our church life is that we tend to to inherit this kind of sense that busyness is a form of fullness, and then therefore the best people, those who are doing the best in upwardly mobile middle class reality, um, are those who are the busiest. And we we tend to say this to each other when you're like, "Hey, how are you doing?" We tend to say, oh, I'm doing pretty well, but really busy, which both is showing that you're kind of exhausted, but it also is a kind of way of flexing and saying, I'm, I got a lot going on and life's going pretty well for me because I have, you know, I'm, I'm in demand here. And I think what's fascinating about that is the way our ch Protestant churches have tend to organize themselves is implicitly and tacitly more than explicitly. We've tended to believe that if we are going to attract busy people we have to be a busy place so the best church in the synod the best church in the conference is the church that is the busiest has the most programs has the most going on and i think while that can get people in the door potentially i think it can impose a kind of spiritual cancer on people that it actually has a way of speeding their lives up so much that they become dis connected from life and one of the reasons the imminent frame becomes accepted is because we don't have enough time to wait for god to act or we even have these experiences of god moving in our life or at least uncanny experiences that should cause us to kind of reflect and think and ask what what does this mean but who's got time for that you just got to keep going and going and going so the presumptions that the world is only a natural material place start to make all sorts of sense because our lives are so busy and so accelerated that the only kind of relationships we can have with ourselves, with the world with those around us become instrumentalized and uh we 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 just we, we don't have time to reflect, which connects to kind of Paul's point is that there is a disobedient way of waiting that is in action, but the kind of waiting that the church is called to in Acts 1, and I think the kind of waiting that the younger Bloomhart is, is inspiring Bart to think about and, and build his theology around, is a kind of waiting with a story, a kind of waiting with what the what the Bloomharts call the watchword, a kind of a, 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 a phrase of that encompasses the narratives of the way God has acted in the world. And so um, the, the church in Acts 1, the disciples in Acts 1, go and wait with the very story of Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, and have to kind of make sense of that. So it's not just a kind of waiting where we, where we sit on our hands, but it's kind of a waiting with a story, waiting with a way of trying to make sense of the world, and then, um, and then attending to the ways God may be acting and preparing for God to act um, within our community and within the world. And one of the things I really try to draw out from Bart's theology in this is that, and maybe the kind of core of the ecclesiology is that too often, and particularly in American Protestantism, we have told pastors um, that their church has to be the star of its own story. Like, what's your story? How are you going to compete? Um, and I think one of the things that Bart wants to get at is that um, the real story here, the, the, the two stars of the story are God and the world. And the church is always is a supporting role of testifying, of witnessing to, of waiting with the world for God to act, of pointing the world to God's action in the world. But the church is never the star of the story, that really the star of the story, that the two main actors in the story are God and the world. And I think when we feel the crisis of decline, it so quickly becomes, what's your church's story? How is your church more important? How are you going to keep your church alive? The, the church so easily becomes the star of its own, of it, of its own story. And um, again, that ultimately perpetuates it as nothing more than a small business or maybe a big business, depending on how big the church is. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it just, it, 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 then ironically, the church just perpetuates the imminent frame.
Mm. Would you like to speak to that, Paul? Or? Well, yeah, I, I, I think about. So let's let's say you take a uh, a traditional view of the authorship of the books of Timothy. One one of the interesting things you find then in in those books is you find Paul, who is, you know, I always see Paul of Tarsus as a little bipolar. He can be hugely excited sometimes and terribly depressed other times. He just flips back and forth. I and, think the best ones him, are like that. Uh, you know, like I think Luther's that way too. So yes, he uh, is. He yeah, very right. much is. Right. Um, you know, well, well-behaved Christians seldom make history <laughs> on good on either side. Um, but you you find you find Paul sort of in Timothy as you know. Oh, I've only got you know. Everyone's left me. You know, I, I've 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 traveled all over the Eastern Empire, and it's what what have I accomplished? And uh, no. Paul, you know, I don't know how much you realize how important those letters and those churches actually were, and you're not going to see it in your life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I look at, say, you know, my father's ministry, who, um, you know, pastored one little church in Patterson, and then, you know, a couple other involvement in a couple other churches. And, you know, someone might say, well, how much did you do? It's hard to know. It's really hard to know. And, and again, I got to be careful with that because I know there is sort of a dodge of, you know, of, oh, we were faithful. Well, they were maybe were faithful in your little, in your little frame. We never, we never deviated from these little staves in our bounded set. Okay. But, you know, when I look at what, what ministry involves with individuals, you, you very much see that clock speed where um, if, if you're pastoring with an individual for a long time, you can go years and in fact decades and multiple decades with seemingly very little progress or change and then something late happens. And, and again, I think this is the, this is in a sense where you find God in a world that is only focused on the imminent frame, you know, to get, bring some of the verveki cog sci into this. If, if your relevance realization is always focused on the little cause and effects of, of your ego-driven ministry, then that's the entire thing that you see. And you'll never see anything else because you are only focused on paying attention to this thing right here. Whereas most of the time, we don't see things because we're not looking. And, and the clear teaching of scripture is that oh, God is active and alive. And for those who have eyes to see, they'll watch him and they'll see him. Mm, amen. And uh, I know Andrew, unfortunately, has to go now. So I think that's a, a good place to close up for today then and um do you have any closing comments that either if you would like to make or would you like to tell us about where we can find out more about your work then yeah my only cl closing words would say this has been a fun conversation and thanks to both of you for um for inviting me and yeah um yeah the, the I, I guess my publisher would be mad if I didn't say that the, the book is called churches in the crisis of decline and I guess you can find it wherever you buy books um hopefully so uh, yeah, no, it's been great to talk with both of you. I'll, I'll give a little. I'll give a little pitch for um, for Andrew's books. You know, I in some ways when I read his books, I see he's doing in books what I do on my videos. It's a different clock speed, and um, it requires a little bit more because you have to actually read and not just put it on while you're doing the dishes, like was how my people listen. But you know, I really appreciate the fact that he's wrestling through these issues because they are not easy and um i you know i just encourage people to do similar kinds of wrestling and to read his books and wrestle along with him as he, as he grapples with this stuff because it's it's pretty important mm. Thanks, Paul. excellent thank you both gentlemen and um yeah i'll just close up by saying it. i think you should all watch paul's <laughs> videos and listen to, even when you do the dishes and of course read andy's book and <laughs> god bless you both gents all right. Thanks. Thank you. So Thank you. I'm going there. Nobody can stop me. Ooh, I'm going there. Don't you want to go too? I'm going there.